welcome to each of you. It's very good to see you each here. It's, always, it's very daunting to try to do something like this, and I'm especially heartened tonight because I know that if I lose my way, Micah and Shannon will catch me and put me back on the right track. <laughs> well, that's good too. That's good too. That's what Outward Bound is half about, is helping people to lose their way. Thank you for coming out on this election night, this November night, uh, when in the day the most of the red leaves have fallen and what's left is mainly bronze and brass and yellow and brown, letting those limbs be more naked and gray in the sky. I'm uh, glad to feel that I recognize each of you. These days, uh, we don't always recognize each other. Come in, please. Uh, especially in Halloween time, last Thursday, it was hard to recognize most of the people on the campus. And the student council gave awards for the most subtle costume, the most biodynamic costume, and an award for the teacher who best represented another teacher. And I don't know the official announcement yet, but I think Chris, Christian Davis is wearing uh, Sandy Volpe all day long. <laughs> Seemed to be the best to me. You may or may not know, some of you do know, that uh, 30 of our high school students helped to create the lantern walk down the way and uh, they were pirates, and they were Rumpelstiltskin and Cinderella, and then there was apparently an army of very serious gnomes whacking away at the rocks and then having celebration dances and then back to the whacking. So it's nice for our adolescents to cavort with the spirits abroad in ways that make wonders for the little children in the community. The next day, as some of you may have experienced, we had our All Souls Festival. And a number of the teenagers said later how much it meant to them to have the name of one of their relatives spoken at this assembly. And a visiting um, former parent and friend said afterwards that at her Waldorf school, uh, such an assembly would not have been possible because there wasn't the culture in the community to openly sustain and share the experience of those who have died in our lives. So we, we can't take for granted what it means for our children to be able to carry such experiences together with adults in an open way. Senora Brooks Quinn, our high school Spanish teacher, told me, showed me all the little skulls made out of sugar, which the high school Spanish students had then decorated. And she had told them um, that in the Latin American world especially, death is considered to be sweet. And she asked each one, as he or she bit into the sugar-decorated skull, to think with sweetness of one who had departed. And she said that it got completely quiet and that it then remained quiet and remained quiet. And, <laughs> she, and it kept remaining quiet and finally she had to pull the class back and shift gears. But she also was deeply moved by what they were experiencing with this simple funny-looking little sugar skull. I also would like to uh, mention right at the beginning of our evening that our longtime colleague David Blair died on November 3rd. He was here for 22 years, and uh, he could have been giving a talk like this tonight. And he gave quite a few very well. So I'm <clears throat> sort of dedicating this to him. 
And um, last year, the Eurythmy School asked me to give a couple of talks on adolescence, and they were called Dancing with the Devil, Healing Adolescence. Tonight, we have just one evening, and uh, last month, our science and math colleagues um, shared an evening like this. So I am going to be less ambitious, and I'm simply, rather than trying to touch on the whole high school curriculum, I'm going to just focus on the English curriculum and humanities uh, as a way of, of offering you a lens into the high school, into the adolescent, and really, uh, in fact, ultimately as a way of enlisting you as parents, as colleagues, in um, helping in becoming able to understand how we, the teachers, think about the adolescents and how we adjust the ways that we work according to the age of our high school students. So with that modest task in mind, and we will have time for questions afterwards, um, we sh need, of course, to begin at the beginning and just um, remind ourselves of a little bit of familiar context. And I should have my early childhood experts do this, but in the interest of time, um, <clears throat> let's just remind ourselves that in the first stage of life, the child, the parents, and the teachers are devoted primarily, welcome, are devoted primarily to, to giving all the forces possible to form the physical instrument that the child and then the adult of that individual uh, will use to find his or her way through life. What is the instrument on which we can play the art of our life. That's, in a way, the task of these early years to engender as healthily and as wholly, wholesomely as possible the physical body of the child and what has come into this world, as the women in the room know better than the men, um, is in a certain way above all head. So mysteriously enough, physically the child is mostly head. First head coming out for most children and mostly head. That is what is most formed in this physical instrument at birth. Physically. The consciousness almost has nothing to do with the head, the consciousness of the early <coughs> child. The consciousness is, I mean, any people, Olympic athletes have tried to imitate the movements of babies and have been exhausted after four or five hours. And the consciousness of the child is all in the limbs, is all moving. It's as though, it's as though the, the, the limbs bring the world to the child and bring the child into the world. Action, action, action. <coughs> and in these early years, the simple mode of learning is imitation. I'll just remind you of um, Wordsworth's poem, Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God, who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. The 
heaven lies about us in our infancy, the mood of childhood is really one of devout awe, reverence, religion, and um, Wordsworth has another line, as if his as, as if his vocation were endless imitation, something like that. And the child experiences in this, experiences the whole world just permeated through and through with goodness. That's the virtue which abounds in this, in this sort of connected, unified, religious, mooded <laughs> world uh, imbued with willing. And this is the, 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 the world of the child up until the change of teeth, often around the age of seven, six, eight, somewhere in there, up until the change of teeth. And at that point, there's a, when, the, when the teeth fall out and the new ones come in, it seems to be a kind of a signal that the primary work of engendering the physical instrument, the primary work, has now been accomplished. And some of those forces which were forming the physical instrument right down into the organs as well, some of those forces are released and are free for new kinds of learning. And in terms of physical growth, now the, the rhythmic system starts to expand with length and to expand with, with depth probably breadth as well. The lungs expand, the heart expands, the rhythm between heart and lungs, usually I think around nine or ten, finds basically a four beat per breath relationship, it sets into that settles into that rhythm, <coughs> and as one breathes out and breathes in, it, and as this realm expands, the, the sort of the chamber of the heart uh, really becomes the basis, welcome, for, for the primary mode of learning no longer being through the limbs, but, but really through this middle realm, and in terms, of, in terms of consciousness, that really is primarily through <coughs> feeling, so that, so that the child experiences everything that he or she knows in a manner <laughs> that is artful, that is unified, that is that it has the kind of freshness of design of art and the, in the integrity and cohesion of art. And the child experiences the whole world permeated with beauty and the class teacher is the representative of the whole world being the author of the child's experience of the world and part of what is most mysterious about this second stage which is very hard to, to understand in a clear mm -hmm. rational way is that because the primary work of, the phys of, of forming the physical basis has been established and sort of put into place, what, what is happening here is that, the, is, is that all of the life forces which inform the physical instrument, all of those shaping forces which the parents have given, which the teachers have given, now, the child sort of takes over, becomes more and more author of much of that forming, so that the child's own life body 
we could say. In the Waldorf world, sometimes the world, word etheric is used. The child individualizes and becomes increasingly the shaper and the former himself of his or her own life body, harmonizing, uh, raising healthily, vitally, this growing physical instrument. And that brings us to the great threshold, to the abyss perhaps, to the gates of Eden, the passageway from which there seems to be no return, to the end of innocence, to the fall, yes, the fall, the inescapable fall, sooner or later. And that's, we stand at those gates tonight. That's our world which we are now going to enter together. And I'm very relieved we have an Outward Bound instructor with us in case things go wrong, in case our alumni aren't able to rescue us. Because we may well lose our way. This happens in this terrain. So, let's just... Remind ourselves what the objective experts say in terms of our English language consciousness. Puberty, according to Webster's, is the period of life during which the genital organs mature, secondary sex characteristics develop, and the individual becomes capable of sexual reproduction. So that's pretty good. That's pretty clear. I think the medical schools would agree, and we can all... Uh, accept and acknowledge and recognize that. Puberty, and I don't think I realized this for a long time, puberty really is just the gates right here to adolescence, which is, which is, um, is sort of, perm is, is the title really of our whole thing in a way. And adolescence is different from puberty. Adolescence, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is the process or condition of growing up. Let's just remember that physically the child actually has been growing down, right, from here to here. But in other ways, growing up, the period which extends from childhood to manhood or womanhood ordinarily considered as extending from 12 to 21 in females and from 14 to 45 in males. <laughs> oh no, that, sorry, that's 14 to 25 in males. And um, we should just remind us, and our historians will tell us this, that, that and it still is the case in many parts of the world, that at puberty, uh, the woman becomes a mother, and um, in the old days, the man, well, the man, the man goes to work and becomes uh, an apprentice first, but goes right to work at puberty. Uh, so childhood met adulthood like this, and then it's really in the last couple of hundred years that this in-between zone has opened up. This is this zone of adolescence, roughly about seven years. And <coughs> if we had more time, I would ask you to close your eyes and remember something of your adolescence. But I know that will be unbearably painful, and it might just stop the whole evening. <laughs> so rather than ask you to do that, uh, might it suffice just to say that although there were periods of extraordinary perception and brilliance, creativity and insight, I would be very surprised if any of us in here escaped periods of unbearable agony and pain and of feeling lost and isolated and alone and possibly even suicidal. 
and uh, it, for many people, remains the most difficult stage of one's life, in spite of all of the challenges that come. And some people have spoken of, in fact, Rudolf Steiner speaks of, adole of adolescence as really a kind of a state of prolonged illness. That we move from the health of childhood into the equivalent of a kind of an illness spread out in this time. And in that sense, we could ask ourselves, how does the curriculum of a Waldorf school serve um, as a kind of a homeopathic healing, not to remove the illness, but to help the illness allow and foster the wholeness of the emerging individual. And I want to just, um, before we get down to specifics, I want to share with you something which I shared that those nights that, uh, at the Rhythmy School, <coughs> and which I've shared before here, and that is that in Guatemala, on Lago Atitlan, there is a Tsutuhil tribe, um, focused especially in Santiago Atitlan, who have a very profound sense, and this was, uh, this was true very recently, and it still is to a smaller degree, a very profound sense that once the boys and the girls become capable of romantic love, it is absolutely crucial that they become initiated into the mysteries of death. If the boys and girls in adolescence, according to the Tsutuhil, are not sufficiently or at all initiated into the mysteries of death, they may well actually get through life okay. But after they die, they will be lost, profoundly lost. And the Tsutu heal experience that lost souls after death hang around and they suck at the living. They suck at the community of the living. They suck at the souls of the men and of the women, of the parents, of the friends, and, uh, and, call, and wreak havoc in the community of the living, causing addiction, depression, violence, disease, just wreak havoc on the fabric of the living. That's an interesting perspective. That's a much larger perspective than most of us in the West have been capable of. So we might, if there's any validity to that, we might also ask ourselves, does the Waldorf curriculum sufficiently initiate our teenagers into the mysteries of death? Okay, you ready? So, one of the earliest main lessons that the ninth graders have through the English department is called usually the story of drama or the history of drama. So, in this main lesson, the ninth graders learn that Western drama has its origins long ago in ancient Greece, inside the dark, secret centers of the Temple of Dionysius. And the ninth graders learn that those who wish to be initiated into the mysteries of Dionysius have to prepare themselves for years so that they are inwardly strong enough to enter in and in the dark, what they will experience will be a reenactment by the, by a, the priests of Dionysus, a reenactment of 
the dismembering of Dionysus, being ripped apart into pieces, and then the remembering of Dionysus, being recomposed. In our later language, you might even say resurrected. <coughs> if the novitiate were not sufficiently prepared, that experience, that enactment, could be so powerful that the, that the novitiate would die. That was the power of the drama. And then the ninth graders learn that at a certain point, the initiates decided it was important to share some of these secrets, of these mysteries of life, um, of, excuse me, of death and rebirth with the public at large. So the drama comes out into the openness of the amphitheater and uh, eventually at certain times all of the polis of the Greek society were in fact required to experience the tragedy which some of you will remember Aristotle defined as an imitation of an action through pity and fear effecting a proper purgation of the soul. Purgation, catharsis. So the wise elders realized that the whole community needed for the health of the soul of the whole community, as well as for the individuals, to experience the, the, the catharsis engendered through the tragedy. And that's the original gesture of God. They follow, there were comedies as well, they follow <coughs> drama down through later Greek drama into Roman times, some early Roman dramas, the degeneration of drama in Rome, uh, culminating in the, the shedding of blood in the Colosseum with gladiators and animals and Christians and others. That it really, in a way, becomes the death of drama. And then the ninth graders experienced that in the catacombs underneath the streets of Rome, a, a, a priest sang and um, three choristers answered and um, they reenacted the three Marys asking the angel at the tomb where, uh, where Jesus was. And that secret reenactment underneath in, in the catacombs was the spark that regenerated drama and ended up eventually flowing out into the churches and then flowing out into the streets, enacting all kinds of scenes from the Bible and then becoming traveling mystery dramas throughout Europe in the Middle Ages. And uh, when the students, the ninth graders, experience uh, Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream in the Globe Theater, where the students realize that all the world is a stage, they're then capable of looking back on Oedipus the king and seeing that Oedipus, um, that the play starts when the, when the village is suffering from plague. Oedipus takes charge to, to uh, solve the problem, discovers that he's the cause of the problem because he killed his father and married his mother. And the plot, the shape of the plot is like that. Whereas with the Midsummer Night's Dream, they see that, that the marriage is, is about to happen with Theseus and Hippolyta and the four lovers. And then Oberon and Puck get involved and the wrong people fall in love with the wrong people, including Titania falling in love with the ass-headed bottom, so things go down like that, and then in the end, finally, Puck fixes things up, and the right people love the right people, and everybody gets married. And then, when they see that, that's the essential shape of the masks of com comedy and tragedy, they, everything goes silent, and they go, oh! And they just realize that some, there's something primal permeating our whole life, 
including all of our television and movies today, there's this primal polarity um, which informs all of these dramatizations of the story of the human being. And they, they live between that polarity and understand the ebbs and flows throughout time as, as mankind comes in to modern times. Uh, and this, in a way, is a keynote for the whole unfolding of this period of adolescence in which now the soul expands. It really is kind of born with puberty. The soul is born and it's It has this whole stretch of time to, to grow, and this drama main lesson is really a keynote for the whole history of the soul of humanity, at least in the Western world. On the other hand, lest we get too drowning and wrapped up in the glorious messes of our own souls, and lest we find, I mean, lest we lose our way in the endless morasses of our own souls. We as Waldorf teachers and you as Waldorf parents after tonight know that in order to healthily, wisely, soundly weave this wild, lawless, being of the soul, which knows no bounds of time and space. You see, the, the physical body is the space body. The life body works with timing. That's the sort of the rhythm body. That's the time body. And this soul, it'll stay up all night long doing gigs and playing games, and it has no respect for any of this world here, if allowed. And this soul nature, uh, it's a very mysterious thing. Some of you know it also can be called the, the astral body. And it's really the body of consciousness, of, and it it's can see things critically, and it sort of eats away and corrodes. The life body builds up. It's anabolic, and the astral body is catabolic. It's, it's sort of eating away at things. It's, it's, it almost likes to decompose, so it can be very destructive, as any of you Remember, and as any of you parents of teenagers know, and hence all the more reason that this emerging soul body, which loves lawlessness, be grounded in this ninth grade, in this ninth grade, if we think of this physical body, if we remember how it is the primary instrument, and we now think as our thinking finally comes into its own. Not when we're three years old in kindergarten, and not when we're eight years old, uh, but when we're teenagers in adolescence and high school, when our thinking finally comes into its own, we can learn the laws of the physical world, the unmistakable lawness, law, lawfulness of the physical world, and the teachers try, the teachers try to have this, if we think of this soul body, oops, I should put that over here, sorry. If we think of the, if we think of the, well, I'll do it this way. If we think of the soul body as almost like a flower, right? We've got our, we've got our roots down here, and here we've got our stalk, our stem, or our trunk, right? And now there's something flowering, and yet at the base of the flower, we want to do our teaching in such a way that we are really providing, at this level, the equivalent of this physical grounding, right? It's 
It's almost as though we're doing, we're, we're recapitulating the physical basis for the soul body, the astral body, in the ninth grade. So, we want them to be in the 20th century, we want them to be here, we want them to be down to earth, we want them to know the facts of the matter, and as a consequence, our other ninth grade main lesson is, so this was drama, right, for, in a way, for the whole adolescent unfolding, but the other one, I'm just going to have to, well, I'll put it here, is the novel. And the novel, the latest form of the human story, is concerned with the here and the now, with us regular local people leading our regular local lives, <coughs> and this is a way of grounding the ninth grader. We, um, as many of you know, you use the mov novel Moby Dick, and uh, the students learn all the parts of the whaling ships, and they learn how to tie the knots, they go to Mystic Seaport, they throw harpoons, and they climb the rigging, and they draw maps of, <coughs> of the whole world, and where Melville went, and where the Pequod went. They get very grounded in the physicality of it all, and yet, um, nevertheless, in this particular novel, as some of you know, uh, they, they experience that the, well, the first, Ishmael's first experience is that at night, suddenly his greatest horror in the world jumps into bed with him at midnight in New Bedford, and that is a yellow, purplish, tattooed cannibal with a hatchet in his hand. Jumps right into his own bed. He's completely scared, of course. The landlord comes in and helps things straighten out. And then this is a harpooner who is a cannibal. But by morning time, the cannibal's hand is on, is over, is, is on, on Ishmael's um, arm, and they end up uh, sort of marrying each other in the sense that Queequeg decides his fate is aligned with Ishmael's. He gives him half his money and says, you choose the boats. And very quickly, the greatest horror of all becomes the ally and the brother and the mate. That's sort of the keynote of the whole story. And uh, the crew of the ship includes, includes this, this uh, purple-yellow character Queequeg from the Pacific. It includes the red harpooner from Nantucket, Tashtego, and it includes the black uh, African Dagu from Africa. And uh, so it includes, in a way, the whole spectrum of colors of peoples, almost all. There's some, there's some uh, other colors as well on the ship. The, uh, the mates are, are white from Nantucket, uh, Martha's Vineyard, and Cape Cod. And Ahab, the captain is all self. And Pip, the little black cabin boy, loses his self. And all of the other crew from islands all over the world are isolatos. Federated under one keel, federated along the one keel of the, of the Pequod. So it becomes a very, uh, a very universal uh, um, metaphor, really, for all of the peoples of the world, all of the colors. They're all united and fused in this pursuit of Moby Dick, who um, is experienced as ubiquitous. And ubiquitous, Ishmael explains, means uh, that, that Moby Dick is in space the way infinity is in time. That he, people see him in the Pacific, they see him in the Atlantic, they see him up in the Arctic, and he's just, he's just everywhere. And this, this large, large force really is a picture of the metabolic force, forces. You see, here we are, the <coughs> thinking has emerged as the faculty of consciousness. 
And now we've finally in the high school grown down into our long, long limbs and into our reproductive organs and our metabolic system. And um, here's Moby Dick surging beneath the surface of consciousness, this mighty, mighty power. Jane was just heard on NPR the other day that men supposedly think about sex every 15 seconds or something. Uh, and it's a little hard to imagine, maybe not with adolescent boys, but just think of the kinds of, of overwhelming powers that are going on with the girls and their in their menstrual cycles with the boys, with their testosterone, this image of chasing the whale, pursuing the whale, trying to become conscious of it, even became, being able to become master of it, is a powerful um, externalizing image for the volatile ninth grader. The tenth grader moves into a different domain of experience. The 10th grader has survived the 9th grade, and the 10th grader um, physically is starting to catch up with the body. The boys have shot up 6 to 10 inches in the 9th grade sometimes, and they're dangerous. James Mikio has been injured himself 6 or 8 times already this fall. Uh, the tenth graders have a kind of a poise. It's a little bit like the fifth graders in ancient Greece. The tenth graders also turn back now away from the modern world, look back to ancient cultures, and they have a kind of a poise, and it, this enables them to have a kind of perspective, which the ninth grader doesn't have. The ninth grader is just trying to be here right now. The tenth graders look back, the history curriculum goes back to ancient cultures, comes up through ancient Greece, and the wise high school teachers, due to the helpful insight of the wise Rudolf Steiner, do their best to have the curriculum of the ninth grade, the way of approach of the, I mean, sorry, the curriculum of the tenth grade, and the way of the, uh, the, the way of approach of the 10th grader, the high school teachers try to have still, you could say, the basis for this emerging soul life, the basis in the 10th grade, whereas in the 9th grade, it was a recapitulation of the physical development. In the 10th grade, it's a recapitulation of the life body development. So we're trying to permeate the learning, the soul experience, with with, with rhythm, with timing, with conscious understanding of how things work. Of processes, of patterns, of shapes, influences. We can look not just at the world, which the ninth grader needs to be able to do. Oh, and I should read to you. Um, we have them write in journals all year long, starting in November. They haven't started yet. And uh, they just describe primarily the physical world in which they live. So here is an example of a ninth grade journal entry. Through our kitchen window in the distance is a very big northern red oak tree. They have stout branches with leaves that are seven inches long with bristly toothed tips. They are dark green in spring and summer, but from fall they change to dark ruby red. The bark is dark gray with long scaly ridges. Since it is taller than the other trees, it is like a flaming torch in the fall. But right now, it is still. Its limbs are frozen. Beholding the world. Ninth grade. Tenth grade. We start sometime in the fall with the art of poetry. And the place to begin, of course, is, God said, in the... In the, in the Judeo-Christian tradition and, and Muslim, uh, God said, let there be light. God said, this, God said, that, God said that. In the beginning was the word. 
It's the work of the word which can create the world. And then on the sixth day, the creator creates in his own image man and male-female created he them in the image of the creator. So the, we, the human creatures, are the, in the image of the creator and yet our creating comes through our ability to work with words, naming the creatures and naming all of our experiences and naming our world. That's our work as <clears throat> recreators, you could say, through the word and the students experience that um, the students experience that they, they experience changing rhythms of language uh, throughout time. They, they experience the ancient Greek uh, of, the, of the dactylic hexameter. They come north and they experience the old Anglo Saxon of Beowulf. Four beat alliterative line. And then they experience several centuries later Chaucer's Middle English. On the top of his short is altar, the dot of March are perced at all the altar. Father every day in speechly cool, of which will to on John the Dins the flu. And they experience this longer five beat line uh, with the the iambic pentameter rhythms and less of the consonantal alliteration. And then they come to Shakespeare and the sonnet, let's say, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds. And so they experience the language itself evolving. They love the, the hard forcefulness of the old Anglo-Saxon. It gives them more power than their four-letter words these days most of which came from the old Anglo-Saxon. And then with Chaucer's Middle English, they feel this melodious language which talks about stories of love and it really meets them um, as kinds of love are starting to become possible. And then they culminate in writing a sonnet themselves. And they, in addition to getting, uh, learning the rhythms of poetry, and the kinds of imagery in poetry so that they can be conscious of how poems are crafted and how any stories of human experience are crafted. They study two other major works in the 10th grade, the Bible and the Odyssey. <coughs> and, well, very simply, they, 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 this, this huge just work, really, of all literature, uh, which permeates certainly the Western world and increasingly the rest of the world, they become able to, to, to discern patterns uh, within. Um, one example is, uh, so right in the beginning in Genesis, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, is barren and then is made fertile by the Lord and gives birth to Isaac. And that's true of Rebekah and of Rachel, that the woman, the barren woman, is made fertile by the Lord. And then in the Song of Solomon, the, uh, the Sheba, the, the, the woman, is compared to a garden enclosed, and her lover is compared to the wind bringing fertility to the garden. And uh, then, uh, then the whole people of Israel are down in Egypt and wander through the desert, so the world becomes barren and they move from the desert to the promised land where there is new fertility promised by the creator. And there are times then when the people of, of Israel are, are um, called uh, a harlot uh, rather than, um, rather than even, uh, even something like the original barren woman. And Yet, uh, with the time of Christ, <coughs> um, all of the people of humanity, in fact, become potentially the bride of the Son of God. 
all of humanity becomes the bride. And in the book of Revelation, uh, all of humanity uh, is called the New Jerusalem. And the New Jerusalem is, descends and is called the bride of Christ. So all of humanity somehow becomes raised beyond death and beyond sin. So the, 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 the students learn a kind of a metaphorical flexibility, seeing how different things are metaphorically equal to each other. They also see, they also see not only how Adam and Eve can fall out of Eden and then have their children like that, but they see how that kind of pattern repeats itself countlessly in many versions, in, in many small ways, uh, and all of humanity in a way goes down to the point where it kills the Son of God and then rises to when there is the resurrection of, the, of Christ and eventually the new Jerusalem of the overcoming of death of all of human, by all of humanity. So they see this large pattern repeated in a lot of small variations. The Odyssey, they also see uh, a similar pattern, in fact, Odysseus goes through all kinds of trials. The other, this other, so we have this Judeo-Christian influence on the Western world, and we have the Greek influence. And, and in this theodicy, uh, Odysseus, through lack of self-control, loses more and more of his men. Finally, he has to go into the underworld, and then he, he's able to re-emerge, and finally he comes home. Um, very much humbled, very much more in control, and having strengthened his own individual thinking um, to get himself there. Athena does not help him until he gets back to Ithaca itself. So they, they, they take in these two epics in the 10th grade <clears throat> and really have a sense of a vast sweep of the human story. The 11th grade is in a certain way, the greatest challenge of all. You probably think back on your own high schools as the time when that was hardest academically. But it wasn't just hardest academically. It was hardest soul-wise. Most likely all of us in this room. And this, this 11th grade year, oops, this 11th grade year is the time when this soul body or astral body really comes into its own. No longer are the teachers sort of physicalizing the soul. No longer are the teachers um, working on this healthy, almost plant-like life basis of the soul, rooting it, weaving it to, to the physical and life body of the child, but now the soul is here in its own right. This is, this is almost the purely astral or soul stage of adolescence, right here in the 11th grade, and that means it's the deadliest. It means that these catabolic forces and this lawlessness can <coughs> wreak havoc most uh, severely. Every single 11th grader goes through a profound kind of crisis, one kind of isolation or another, one kind of fear or another. And uh, this is where there will be notions of suicide if, they, if they're going to exist in, in our students. And it is crucial that they get what they need in order to get through this. The... English curriculum, <laughs> believe it or not, rather than protecting them or um, turning them away from, takes them right down into hell through Dante's Inferno. This wasn't the case in, in Mikan's day here at Green Meadow, but it was the case in Shannon's day. So it took us a while to realize how important this was. So they studied Dante, <coughs> and they followed Dante down into hell, through all the nine levels of hell, and they learn about 
the nine sort of archetypal kinds of sin and they become conscious of it. And they see the consequences on these shades who suffer through all eternity. And that is a profound awakening, a profound schooling. It helps them to read the, 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 the signs and the language of the dangers of the soul. And uh, they get an experience of not only climbing out of hell, but then going up the mountain of purgatory, where the individuals are able to cleanse, to purge their souls of their sins through catharsis, and finally even get an experience of paradisio, <coughs> guided by Dante's own beloved Beatrice, for whom he had this powerful love through his own life. This is, um, this is really going into the belly of the beast, going into the darkness, illuminating it, meeting it, knowing it, which takes courage, Unfortunately, Virgil gives Dante that courage. <clears throat> and then, as many of you know, these Waldorf schools have the wisdom of giving the students the experience in uh, this medieval experience of the story of Parsifal, which um, very, very simply is the story of an innocent, ignorant fool who knows not who he is, <clears throat> who knows nothing about knighthood, and in his ignorance, he hurts person after person after person. Not intentionally and not even knowingly, knowingly. and yet these people suffer in their lives because of him. Uh, one relative is even killed by him. And uh, nevertheless, this is a person of great promise, and he is brought into the castle of the Grail, where the Lord of the Grail suffers an unbearable wound. And this fool, first of all, uh, was a very good boy because he did everything his mommy told him. And uh, he kept doing everything his mommy told him until a teacher told him to stop doing everything his mommy told him and start doing what I, the teacher, tell you. So he was a good young knight doing everything his teacher told him, and his teacher had told him not to ask questions. So although man was suffering unbearably right before him, because he was being a good boy and doing what his teacher told him, he didn't say anything. And because he didn't say anything, the man continued to suffer. And that inability to meet a human being in the moment led to great suffering for the fool himself. And although he married a beautiful queen and became, was a loyal, loving husband, and was a, an extraordinary knight, able to win battle after battle, and always working for right. Um, for years he had to wander alone in the wasteland <coughs> until finally a hermit um, helps him to, to acknowledge his mistakes, to, uh, to be clear about what he has failed to do, the hermit takes the fool's sins upon him, and then this fool gets to the point of being able, in fact, to be responsible enough to be chosen to be the Lord of the Grail. And this happens uh, because of inward changes, and when he comes back to the ailing Lord of the Grail, he looks at him, and he says essentially something as simple as, Uncle, what's the problem? Or what, 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 what's your pain? It's a very simple colloquial statement. It's just one person speaking to another out of a, some kind of a instinctive response. And those simplest of words alleviate the Lord of the Grail from all his suffering, alleviate his whole kingdom from all of its suffering. And it's a picture of what can happen in the long, long run for all of humanity. It gives the students a courage to persist and a sense of persisting for the sake of the whole, in spite of much adversity. The students also, so they have Dante, they have Parsifal, then they go to Hamlet, <coughs> and there the experience that young Hamlet 
through all of his uh, reflecting, his thinking, 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 as our 11th graders are now capable of doing, thinking, 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 his thinking, 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 nevertheless can't bring his will into alignment with his thinking, and uh, he does so much thinking that words, 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 just becomes words, words, words. There's so many words around that like our people today, we're just smothered with meaningless words. Hamlet becomes smothered with meaningless words, and that means that the whole world around him becomes just a sterile promontory, lifeless and dead. And that leads him, of course, to the question to be or not to be. And uh, he's left dead, as many others are. The tragedy ends, and in a way there's a picture of of the modern consciousness separating itself from the natural world and experiencing the barrenness that natural science has in some ways left us with. And the <clears throat> 11th grader experiences that very powerfully, but then he has romantic poetry. Then he has romantic poetry. Um, at the end of his year, so that William Blake, and Wordsworth, and Coleridge, and Keats, and Shelley, and Byron can, can see into the life of things in the world through, with imagination which enables humanity to rebridge the gap between subject and object, between me and the world, to reunite the world into a mutual living whole, and that heals the sundering and the rendering of the 11th grade experience. So, uh, bear with me and we will uh, have a quick taste of the 12th grade. I do want to read you um, two, two 10th grade poems and then one 11th grade poem and then we'll get to the 12th grade and then we'll see if you have any questions on your minds. So here is a sonnet by an 8th uh, grade boy called On First Looking Into Poetry. When we first met from afar, I was hesitant to explore it. It had always scared me, the writ, W-R-I-T, like right. Yet I went forth prepared to die. And many boys going into poetry feel they're about to die. <laughs> telling myself it was only a lie. But then it was as if something lit and something turned what once was frit. Now frit's a word most of us don't know, but some of us might realize that it is the sand and grit which becomes fused into the clarity of glass. And something turned what once was frit into glass. I was no longer shy. Now I journey over green grass. Finally I am free to roam through stories too good to pass. And now I feel quite at home, all alone but safe and warm as I burrow myself deep within a poem. Whew. So imagine what a difference that makes right? from just being fear of the writ and being able to burrow oneself deep within a poem. It's 10th grade still. And here's a, 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 a 10th grade girl's sonnet called Hatching. Her splintered world lies in shards around her. So just remember the, the nature of this astral world compared to the Garden of Eden down here. Her splintered world lies in shards around her. The warm, dark sphere where nothing had a name has crumbled. And she wakes to cold and pain. Freedom, fear, confusion, all have found her. Her lifeblood rushes madly through her veins. Right? She still feels these, these life forces, her lifeblood rushes madly through her veins, her naked, half-formed, fragile, ugly frame, that physical body, the instrument, 
feels just like a, a, a useless, unfitting uh, embarrassment, no longer has the shelter and vulnerability, no longer has the sheltering walls that bound her, she struggles to stand on delicate, unformed feet, to focus on some distant light, sorry, on some distant lights, plural, to focus on some distant lights, the angel's eyes. They look so quiet, calm, clear-minded, sweet. She reaches her fingers towards the sky, gently, her new begins to beat. She spreads her airy wings, begins to fly. She spreads her airy wings, begins to fly. In a certain way, we could say the ninth grade needs to be the, the year of land. The tenth grade is really like the year of the sea or the ocean. And the 11th grade is really, it's, it's, just, it's just air, just air. And yet we have to be able to navigate to the air. And she's reaching toward that. Now here's an 11th grade poem called Right Through the Middle. Is it best? To be black or best to be white? Should one be only priest? Should one be only knight? Is it better that one has solely delight or that one exists wholly in anguish? That's the nature of this soul body. Right? Delight, anguish, I love, I hate, I'm up, I'm down. If one only saw the heavens so rosy and bright and ignored completely the vanquished, would that be right? If there were but one direction in which one could strive to reach a goal, one would not need a life. But since there are opposites from which to choose, one must live, form his own balance, and find his own truth. Perhaps one could think, in answer to the riddle, that the best way to go is right through the middle. Which actually is par sival, can be understood as through the, the valley, or and sometimes through the middle. Right through the middle, black and white mixed, like the magpie's plumage. So that's the last line of the poem. And the magpie is the keynote image for the whole Parseval story. So there's this, and the way to navigate is through the middle, through the two poles, between the two poles. All righty. One more? Good. We, we don't want to just leave ourselves at the 11th grade. So if our 11th grader has survived, and they do, well, 99% of them do, but, but a few, a few uh, can't quite make the journey. So if they survive all the temptations and all of the assaults, while they're lost alone, away, they don't, they feel, they don't feel they're with their parents, they don't feel they're with their class, if they survive all that, they come back to the 12th grade and they bring back They are the conquering heroes, the conquering heroines. And they know, they know the world. <coughs> and they know it. This, in a way, is the most artfully challenging year for teachers. Because, because um, I always, I apologize for the mess of all this. I always tell the students that their work 
has to be seven times better than my work because they are Walder students. <coughs> but the, the, 12th, the teacher of the 12th grade, and really the parent of the 12th grade as well, is working to help this soul develop. And part of the mystery, of course, is that there's still three years after the, after the, the schooling for this development to continue. So we can't work just with the soul, in a soul way, the way we could more with the 11th grade. We work with some hint of what is guiding that soul, some hint of what is weaving that soul into a whole, what is weaving that soul in relation to the life body, in relation to the physical body, what is unifying this whole complex being. And that is, it's what that girl was saying were the angel's eyes, I think. It's the, it's the eye, it's the light of the eye. Which is informing all of this development and orchestratingly unifying all of this development. Now, most of us in this room, with a couple of exceptions, went to schools where it was really important to try to fill up your resume and be as big and powerful and as impressive an eye as possible. And um, that's not what it's all about. And um, more than Freud, more than B.F. Skinner, more than Jung, um, Rudolf Steiner, in a way that is unique as far as I know to any understanding of the mystery of the I, says that the I is not a matter of fullness. It's not a matter of all you've got, all you've been, and all you've collected, and what you can do. The, the mystery of the I is that one's I only really comes into being through one's perceiving of the I of another. That is very mysterious. Through your I and your I and your I, my I comes into being. The degree to which I can recognize you as you are as an individual uniquely, somehow, in some alchemical process, is what helps my I to become even more who I am as an individual. That is profoundly mysterious. And that makes all the difference. And it's why our Waldorf seniors don't strut around like big peacocks. They seem surprisingly at rest in themselves, surprisingly natural, and surprisingly interested in whomever they knew. And in a simple way, and I think probably I'll just end with this, um, we work with Russian literature, we work with Faust, but because our journey has been taking us a little longer tonight than I had planned, um, I'll just leave this as a central image for you. And it's all around us in this room tonight. In the birth of American literature, in the birth of the American nation, in the birth of the American consciousness, we are here, our school is in the United States of America, and our students, our seniors, spend time, as the seniors are doing right now, with Frederick Douglass, and with Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Henry David Thoreau, and Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne and Emily Dickinson, the mother of American poetry, and Walt Whitman, the father of American poetry. And Walt Whitman's Song of Myself does sometimes um, pay attention, for example, to various parts of his own physical body, but above all, essentially, Walt Whitman's Song of Myself in a way that surpasses any poetry like it in the past is a song of 
all kinds of people throughout this vast nation. The Canuck and the prostitute and the red man on the log roller and the mother grieving and all kinds of people, the soldiers wounded in the war, they are, they compose himself. So the 12th grader becomes able in his thinking to think like a B.F. Skinner, to think like a Freud, to think like a materialist, to think like an idealist, to think like a realist, to think the way any one of us could think. And through that, through that flexibility, uh, that sort of universalizing flexibility, the, the 12th grader becomes as active an eye as possible in a way which it healingly integrates the various members of the 12th graders being and all of the experiences that the 12th graders have. So I'll just close with a 12th grade piece of writing. called Michaelmas. I'm not Walt Whitman, yet I sing a song of myself. I'm not Emerson, yet I contain within me the potential of all humanity. I'm not Tolstoy, yet war and peace wax and wane perpetually within me. I'm not Syrinx, yet my flute weeps when it sings her enchanting lullaby. Today I celebrate Michaelmas, the day on which St. Michael slew the dragon. I'm not St. Michael, yet today I commence my own battle against a very fierce dragon. And this is a quotation from the, the um, Conference of the Birds. Today I raise the cry of the warrior and celebrate the raising of the sword and the shield. The serpent's rattle is the child, afraid to plunge into the reservoir on the mountain behind my house. The mother embracing the child in my room when I wanted to gallop through the leaves in the woods behind my house. Today, my childhood finally jumps out of the old crabapple tree in the yard behind my house. Today I celebrate death, not as the end, but as the door. Yesterday dies. I am the phoenix. You say I've seen the phoenix. When his time comes, he gathers around him a heap of leaves, and from the deepest recesses of his pure heart, he draws out cries of pain. Soon, bird, wood, everything is reduced to living coal and then to ashes. But when the last spark has flickered out, a tiny phoenix appears in the burning, sorry, in the middle of the burning ash. Self-sacrificial fires become ash. Self-sacrificial fires become ash. Inspiration takes flight. Let me swallow the snake that I may shed the skins that I have outgrown. For me, every day is Michael. That, I think, is a picture of a way of navigating that land, sea, air. And if you think of this, this universal I, which is eternal, and every human being has, I think I would call that navigating the light. All right. Thank you.